Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, so I'm Dominic Davis. I founded Pink Therapy, um, and I'm here with Pam Gawler Wright and Iggy Moon. We're here as people who have been concerned about uh, conversion therapy for decades, um, and we are involved as supervisors and as trainers and clinicians in that area. And so, are speaking from our individual. Uh, somewhat different, perhaps at times, but individual ex expertise and experience in the field of this. And it's something that we clearly feel very passionate about. Um, the government have just announced the LGBT conversion therapy consultation. Iggy, what's your first thoughts on it? Uh, my first thoughts are that uh, in the section for talking therapies, uh, talking conversion therapy, which are, I would say, numbers 34 through to 39. Um, I think it's very, very useful. I think it's some, there's some very useful material there that those of us on the MOU2 can work with. And certainly uh, with the MOU2, we can work with government to make sure that a lot of those points are addressed. Uh, so on a first reading, um, and I can see that there is a lot of, wordage so some people may feel a little bit like wow this is a bit heavy mm. but i do think there are some very very useful thoughtful uh points that we can strategically work with on the mou2 that's uh um, your first thoughts i'm glad to see it has been produced it it does actually mark a step forward in a very very long process we've been involved in this as you say for decades so I'm, I'm glad we've got to this place um i see some areas um that need attention um and although they might seem quite subtle i think that if not attended to potentially uh, certain situations for some people could could possibly be exacerbated. Um, so one of the um, issues there is the idea of coercive conversion therapy. Uh, that's what will be stopped. There's an implication that people would be able to consent to conversion therapy. And as we've always discussed, a, a person who is presenting for conversion therapy is a person who is already in a place where they've lost their um, autonomy um, in terms of what pressures, what forces are they experiencing that are taking them to a place where they feel that a part of themselves has to be therapied away or has been created by some kind of unwellness. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And very often people coming for conversion therapy are in fear uh, it may not be directly uh, today, tomorrow, but it could be a year, two years down the line on the street, in a job, um, uh, by family. Um, so that for me is, is being coerced into mm. making a change. Sure, there's a lot of pressure on them to make the change for other people. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I, I, I think it's ironic that the government are talking about abhorrent practices. We hear the Prime Minister and this trust talking about abhorrent practices. It's an abhorrent practice to be doing conversion therapy and they want to stop it. But then they're also saying people can elect to sign up for it if they, if they consent to. And I, I don't really understand. It's a bit like, I read, I read somewhere, somebody said it's a bit like being held up for a mugging. You know, you can... You can give them the wallet over and you can consent to giving your wallet over, but you've still been mugged. Um, and I, th I think that's, uh, that needs to be fed back. And I'm concerned that I haven't seen any reference to asexuality and asexuals being protected. Talks of LGBT conversion therapy and the government's own um, report showed that adults under the quality of life study was, were adult asexuals were more likely to be offered conversion therapy or conversion practices as I think it's probably better to be calling it rather than it's not really very therapeutic. So I'm a bit concerned about that um, and that we need to ensure that asexuals are protected um, and that people can't be, they're talking about being persuaded in 
that you could persuade somebody. So, you know, I think there are lots of affirmative therapists who are very concerned that their work with clients might become um, uh, illegal. And I don't think that's what the government mean. I'm absolutely sure that's not what the government mean. But I think reading stuff around it, it's inferred and we need to, in our response to the consultation, and I would encourage anybody watching this to get into reading it and to, to in, input their feedback into that consultation document, because sure as hell, every parishioner who's going to, to be ch attending church and every viewer on Mumsnet is going to be told, you must send your views in because the government will listen to you and we must you know, pray the gay away or stop these children being persuaded into being trans or whatever their particular messages are. So I would encourage people okay. to, to, to give feedback, yeah. Could, could I just come back though to um, a couple of points on it? Um, sure. Because I can, see, I, can see what's, I can see what you're saying. I'm not necessarily agreeing or disagreeing. I, I think it is worth people who are um, qualified as therapists looking at those sections that I mentioned earlier and maybe um, really digging into what they actually say mm -hmm. because, um, there are a few comments in the document that I think do suggest that um, when people have actually experienced uh, training on the course that opens up the um, uh, maybe opens up the course to ideas uh, about uh, LGBT, then they are unable to maybe focus on LGBT as a defect or deficiency, uh, because it does suggest that um, therapies do need uh, to have professional bodies and regulators to set out, as it does say, professional bodies and regulators are best placed to set out professional obligations and identify practices that are harmful for the individual involved. So. Um, while at one level the document may not be 100% that maybe people, everybody wants, I don't think would ever get that, there are things in it that do suggest professional organisations and, uh, and regulatory bodies can work together uh, to identify the practices that are harmful. I'm not saying, you know, mm -hmm. we have to go with some of the wording, I think, and there are some other points that I think... Mm. <laughs> Are um are worth you know thinking about how we help trainee therapists to understand and to know what is meant by sexual orientation, uh, what is meant by gender in terms of gender identity. Although these terms are all uh, mm -hmm. you know are all part of what the professional bodies and that particular organization, I mean, a psychoanalytic training will take a very different route than mm. maybe a person-centered training in relation to what is meant by gender identity. So it has to work within the remit um, that um, LGBT uh, as, a, as an identity is not a deficiency or a defect. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that some organisations sure. may struggle with, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and it, it, it is, as, you were, as you were saying earlier, it is encouraging to see that tra therapists will be need to get trained yeah, absolutely. To, to be working with, um, with the, our communities, because that's something that we've had in, we, you know, we ensured was into the MOU from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so baseline training is is the first point in our five point ten word policy to take us forward from 2016 baseline training. And what I encounter more and more is um, that where people have become um, afraid of, of working in this area or even have had fears stoked about the MOU that it's going yeah. to terrible thing and that they can be stopped from working exploratory in an exploratory way with clients that I don't know any kind of therapy that can be affirmative that isn't exploratory because if you're not exploratory you have nothing to affirm 
And if you're not affirming, then uh, that's not therapy as you explore, that's interrogation. But I think that some of these fears have come from people simply uh, need their core understandings, their principles, their practices affirmed within this context. What does that actually look like as I work? Because mm -hmm. part of the fear is that when somebody from um, a, a gender or sexual minority comes into the door, comes through the door, suddenly people's skills and knowledge that they have worked with for years suddenly leave them and suddenly become nervous around it. And that's what I try and suggest to people. That is where the word phobia is the right word, really. And even if you say, no, no, I'm just nervous. Well, yeah, that nervousness is, is fear bound. And I think that fear, so much of it for so many people comes from just not having had exposure in, in the training room to what does this actually mean? What is this actually mm -hmm. asking of people? My experience has been, and I'm grateful for the organizations that have had me coming in to train on this, is that people leave so relieved and happy and um, so much more confident sure. and then very, very glad that this was raised for them because they may not have realized that there was confusion um, about this um, issue for, for them. But once we've actually gone through it and they've realized how this is about holding people in their journey, in their process, uh, mm -hmm. without us um, making decisions or diagnoses that somebody is, um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that these differences are in fact down to some, like some kind of deficit or disorder. Um, right. Right. And counsellors don't diagnose. They're not trained to counselors diagnose. Don't and, diagnose. And, 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 and these are self diagnoses anyway, mm -hmm. because there's no objective tests that you can measure whether somebody is gay or asexual or trans. It's based on somebody's self report, isn't it? Exactly. So you listen to the story and you help the person make sense of what that means for them. Lived experience, which is mm -hmm. another one of our. Um, points in our five point ten word. Yeah, I, I think I think the, the well, look as a document, the MOU. I think we're mm -hmm. all incredibly proud to have achieved. I mean, all three of us have been in there since the beginning, which was twenty fifteen, mm -hmm. and we've gone through many many meetings to get to a point where there would eventually be a consultation, and we work towards a ban. A ban is only one part of what we actually want to achieve sure. what we really yeah, want yeah. to achieve is um you know also about looking at what's included in training mm -hmm. and why that's the biggest part i think the biggest, really that's the biggest part yeah. dominic I, yeah. I agree and i think you you at pink therapy and power b leaf have absolutely tried as hard as possible to push this as, as far as it can to to try and get training out there and uh, so the, the, the part for me, there's, there's two parts of this. One is why, why did we need a document? Why did we need an MOU? Why is it questioned? Why should it exist? And a part of me finds that quite an emotional question because actually what it's actually saying is that for those of us that are LGBTIAQ, there are some people uh, who really do not wish us to live our life in that way. Now, it might be for good reasons. It might be because actually uh, they see that as, as, a, as a hindrance to our getting somewhere, but it's only a hindrance because we live in a world that suggests that we haven't got the equality that we should have. A world um, that hinders us. Yeah, and, and, and the emotional side is that I found it that the one word that stuck out for me in the consultation was questioning. And I thought every single LGBTQIA person is forced to question their existence. Mm -hmm. It's either going to be questioned by others. Why are you gay? I mean, what is trans? What does it mean? What do you do in bed? What does it mean to want to be polyamorous? It, question, 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 as though somehow there's some sort of, it's okay for us to be asked these questions, but 
But believe me, when I turn around, and we've seen it recently, if you turn around and say to somebody, well, what does your whiteness mean for you? Well, what does your gender mean for you? Mm. It's almost, oh my God, this is uh, critical race theory. This needs to mm. stop. <laughs> what right have you to start talking <clears throat> about gender? So th there's an emotional side to that for me, which is on that I have not got equality. We do not have equality. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. as straightforward as that. Any marginalised group is marginalised because some people think it's OK to make them feel like they need to ask questions. And some things about, you know, oh, we need... Uh, why, why have we assumed that all children want to develop in a way that if you look at DSM, marginalises those children that don't wish to develop in that way? And these are just questions that we have always asked and we ask in training and mm. are saying, actually, it's pretty obvious to us that not everybody wants a standardised way of leading their life. Now, the, the, the issue about, about affirmation is, is interesting, I think, because the standards of care have, have, have used that word in, in and of course WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, has actually uh, worked at ensuring that people have access to medical treatments and or um, exploratory uh, work in, as, in the most open way possible. But it, for us that are within the LGBTQIA communities, I want to know that if I go to see a consultant, um, they're not assuming that I am heterosexual and that my condition is only going to be treated under a certain set of meanings. Mm -hmm. And for those of us that want to access transition, whatever age that might be, however young or however old, we want to make sure that the pathways are accessible. And, and the standards of care have said that affirmation is really needs to be flexible. And the UK um, it struggles with flexibility, I think, I think we could say, while some other countries don't. So the document, the MOU, is simply saying to therapists, what does that mean in, in, with regard to the work that we do? And, and, uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think as therapists, mm -hmm. we need to be, a, be encouraged to explore who we are. Um, but nobody's asking anybody to work with any client group that they don't feel okay to work with. There, there's many groups that I wouldn't feel okay to work with, but there's others that I do. So um, I think um, the MOU... Well, and there's some people, some people might want to work with a group and not actually be very safe to do so. Yes, because that's of, right. Yes. Perhaps because but of a lack qualified. of training. I think there's also something uh, there's an there's an added dynamic to what you're you're saying, Iggy, because it's not just about having the right to question somebody who is of a diversity. It's also about assuming that the answer to that question must satisfy me mm. if, uh, if I'm a, a person mm -hmm. who is heterosexual cisgender that I am the arbiter to decide whether or not your answer to that question has satisfied me mm -hmm. so that I decide whether or not you are telling the truth about your experience and your existence and whether or not that should be deemed to be acceptable and permitted um, and uh, have access to equality. And that for me is um, the, 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 added um abuse really is it's well it shows of, it's one it shows to be interrogated it's mm. another to say that unless you persuade me that mm. your life is which is so different from mine becomes something i can understand in my own terms of reference and you're not allowed to use language that i don't like or don't know about you're not allowed to use terms that you've made up you can't have new words, you can't have words I don't know. You've got to describe yourself in the terms used to describe simply heterosexuality and cisgender. And uh, that's kind of like asking people to describe a, a spiral staircase without using your hands. 
Um, you know, so I, I think there's there's something. And it lacks it lacks that? cultural humility. It yeah, lacks we, any cultural yeah. humility, doesn't it? That you're willing to listen to and understand what the client's experience of what that means for them is. Yeah. And I think that what the we're basics asking for people of being a, a, a psychotherapist or counselor, as is, I say, is having yeah, yeah, is having some cultural competence. Yeah. and some knowledge and I think knowledge is important I don't think mm -hmm. shared identity is enough or mm -hmm. lived experience is enough mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a, and I also think cultural humility if you're coming from outside of the group you need to mug up and listen to and learn from the group mm -hmm. as to what what their experience of it is um, and not impose your values and beliefs upon them mm -hmm. yeah no, I think it's I, I think it's just that you know, we're in a we're in a time where um, there is a massive shift going on about how the world is, and I see this in my students, my sociology students. Ten years ago, five even five years ago, some of the issues about colonialism, about necropolitics, about um, about uh, you know imperialism, about uh, about incarceration, none of these issues would have been as prolific as they are now. But there are a growing number of people who are not therapists, they're not psychologists, but they have an interest in the world. And there are some psychologists and therapists who share that interest. And yet, you know, I'm aware that when I teach, uh, when I teach about uh, inclusion and, and ethical responsibility, if I say to students in sociology, uh, you know, who are who are already there, you know, they, a lot of them want to talk and interrogate concepts uh, about uh, colonialism and the impact within our social world. Within psychology, when I'm training, I'm very much aware that when I'm working with um, young students, if I say, for example, so what does what does your whiteness mean to you? as a therapist in training, what does that, what's the impact of that on your life, on the life of those around you? What does it mean about the friends that you have, about the position that you've got in the world, um, about your access to training? These, these are things that quite often in that process of reflection uh, lead us to, to, to sort of, sort of not even, it's not about just interrogate, it's to sit with a consciousness that maybe people like Franz Fanon did in the past about, you know, as a black psychiatrist, what it was like to experience his world from the from his position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're aware, aren't you, that in training, it's not just training. It's about processing these deep and more profound experiences so you can connect with your clients. Now, the likelihood is that this is very rarely being in the room because as, as as a person once told me about 30 years ago you know if you can if, if you're if you're a good enough therapist you can work with anybody and it's like but, but you aren't able to work with anybody if you have no understanding that you that my privilege as a white person mm -hmm. has led me to think that I can access things in an easier way than somebody who's very aware that because they are black or brown, they've they've had to have a different route. Now I'm not saying sure. everybody, but I think no. we have to be aware that some of that is in this. This is mm -hmm. not just sure. uh, an M. You know, it's 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 very it's quite. There's profound. a whole context. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. so actually. Yeah. yeah. And also that the 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 dominant group has the narrative, has the culture, has owns the language. Whereas a, a group that is having mm -hmm. to move in a different route, um, yes, may may struggle and need processing, questioning to find words, to find ways to articulate what it is like to be me. And one of the things I think that is um, very sad, very ironic, and does frighten me, is that the the fears around some of the more kind of um, vociferous um, objections to the MOU are about what if somebody transitions and actually they didn't explore enough, they weren't challenged enough, they transitioned without having um, 
really gone through a decision making process. Now, I would like to argue that if you are already coming from a position of infantilizing or pathologizing that person, that person is under more pressure to try and prove their truth rather mm -hmm. than to be able mm -hmm. to express themselves and really also express their own questions, their own doubts, their own fears. You know, one of the things when I'm working with people who are starting transition is, are you ready for how hard this is going to be? You know, and, and what are going to be the hardest things and how are you going to address those? And um, that if anything, that, that slows down a person's process because it is important for them to find um, that, that resilience in themselves, that sense of um, strength that, that they can take the journeys that they feel is right for them. So I feel that, and, and I hear this again and again from um, some of uh, my trans clients is they, they felt their journey in transition was skewed by not being believed mm. for who they were and their yeah. conditions yeah. were limited. I think you're right, Pam, and, and I suppose the starting point is that, and I can understand this from most of the people that, that are training, that why I think transition or trans clients probably set people back a little bit. It's not, it's not actually just the, the idea um, uh, uh, of exploration. We, we all have a, a certain approach, interpretive, person-centred, whatever it is. We know after three years of training, uh, probably before that, but you get the gist of how you're going to work with people. Mm. But transition is also about uh, a medical uh, pathway. It's about mm. hormones. It may well be. It might not be, but it may be. It might be about certain types of surgery. It might. It might not be. You know. Mm. And people. You know. This idea that somehow it's only lesbian and gay people who are trans is is is, is well mythical because yes, yes. as we know uh, trans people uh, sexuality is not the same as gender in this respect um, mm -hmm. but we are respectful of both but I suppose there's that idea that you know I, I as a practitioner uh, choose to work with people that are trans uh, partly because I understand what those pathways are that you know if a person writes to goes to see the GP they're probably going to have to wait three to four years before they even get the first appointment mm -hmm. that okay. is where if anything somebody may need support to survive that four years mm -hmm. anyway yeah, yeah. 18 sure. months 18 months if they're lucky so what's in place where do they go where do they get the support from what do, what do you know if a person's talking about wanting to access hormones then it's for me as a practitioner to either make the decision that I would like to understand what hormones are about, about what levels, about what sort of hormones they may be, um, um, uh, and about the different types of surgery and where to tell people to get support. The idea of accessing transition is not for me a problem. Uh, the problem is it, it doesn't allow people to access transition um, in a way that may be more beneficial if it was if it was done in less than four years. Um, like in a uh, timely manner, yeah. yeah. In less than yeah. seven. Uh, but the idea uh, that somehow uh, the transition itself is wrong or is not okay, that, that to me doesn't enter my framework. My framework mm -hmm. of thinking, sure. uh, as we work with lesbian and gay people, we, you don't go actually, uh, you know, as we know uh, about, uh, you know, lesbians and gay men were this, that and the other, they needed this, they needed that treatment. I mean, they needed treatment. Uh, you know, it was almost like, right, well, uh, you need to go and get some, uh, some, you know, whatever it is, uh, electroconvulsive treatment or whatever it was. But um, I, I, I think that where people are stuck is fundamentally the actual process and procedure of transition probably needs to be understood. What does that involve? And that actually there's a lot of support out there to offer that. Um, and I can I can quite understand that for a lot of I mean, look, when I, I teach the two sex model and the one sex model, a lot of people have never even heard of these. 
it's been assumed there's just two sexes and that's it. But, but that's where it gets caught up in imperialism and colonialism. And I'm afraid, you know, there isn't just a two sex model or a one sex model. It, it doesn't exist like that. We were told back in the 1980s and 90s uh, that being lesbian or gay was somehow a deficiency or a lack or whatever it was, there was something wrong with your relationship to your mother and your father and whatever it was. I mean, I remember somebody, a friend of mine being sent to the GP to have her testosterone levels measured because if she was a lesbian, she must definitely have high levels of testosterone. So you sort of think, well, we've moved on from that. And now we need to, we need to get a grip. You know, this idea, there's a pluralistic model of sexuality and gender. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to accept that, you know, the idea of a two sex model may be great for some people if that's what you want to believe, then fine, you believe it. But you can't believe that alone if you want to work with clients who do not sure. believe sure. that. Because you're yeah. working with more people and wherever oh. there are more people, there will be gender and sexual diversity. Yeah. There will, will be, be more diversity. People. Yes. There will be gay people. There will be bisexual people. You can try and and design your life to only be around people who are within certain groups. But as a psychotherapist, you are going to encounter the range of human beings. And you know what is so um, strange and bizarre to me is when people are seeing this as if it is something new. What is yeah, new yeah, are the right. different waves and yeah. trends of persecution. Yeah, what? and throughout history, there have been times of, of greater expression of diversity and then reactions to that for reasons that are not to do with it being problematic of the diversity, but that it was help, you know, politically expedient to try and impose a two-sex model. And it was expedient to um, try and create an idea of... of human nature of, of nature itself that it was in straight lines and lived in binaries i remember when i first learned that one in 57 people is not strictly mm -hmm. endosexual mm -hmm. that one in 57 people is intersex mm -hmm. and so, you know, ideas that there is some sort of biological sex and, and this is going against science. It's like, you know, what has gone against science is that at different times in history, we have tried to deny. And eradicate, so and eradicate oppress. Anything that doesn't fit in with this, this binary, sex yeah. model. And mm -hmm. you can go, it's across every continent. It's in every mythology. It's in every cultural, uh, mm. historical um, uh, capital that diversity of, of gender identity, diversity of sexuality, diversity of body types, are present, are shown, yeah, right. and then are repressed. Yes, yes. And that's, yeah. that's, that's surely why we process what we do. I, I can understand that, you know, we're treading on ground. I mean, it's almost like, you know, I feel very, very like um, when we have our say as LGBTQIA people, there's very rapidly voices that come out and say, be quiet. Be quiet, you're wrong. You don't know what you are. And I, it's incredibly offensive, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it sure. goes with language. I mean, language, you know, like you're saying, Pam, intersex and endosex. Well, why don't we use a, a more familiar language in everyday mm. usage? But none of this has been included in a lot of the models that we work with. So mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. look at any training manuals, and I mean, if you look at the models themselves, they're often binary. You know, sure. so this is the masculine and this yeah. is the feminine. And it's like, well, that, that if you want, you know, 
Who, who's, what do you mean this is the masculine? Have you read Judith Halbush, Judith Jack Halberstam? Have you, I mean, is there any likelihood that we are going to upgrade our thinking in our profession in order that we incorporate, don't necessarily need to take it on, but at least we, we try and understand these new languages that are flowing. And, and, mm. and, and, and deficit models and deficiencies are not really all that useful. And um, what we ask on the MOU is that people take the time to, um, you know, to share uh, new ideas. And, and you see, there's a lot of fear, isn't there, about, um, about bodies. There's a lot of fear about uh, black politics and brown politics. Uh, there's a lot of fear about, about what happens sex. when, about sex. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of fear because it's never really been on the agenda. Certainly, the the way that we're taught about it is almost infantilizing. And mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I've spent thirty years. Uh, Dominic's probably even longer training people, and mm -hmm. you're very aware. No, oh, I want to talk about sex. It's like it's like, but and, or to take another view. There's there's some models that take a view of sex and gender which is within a framework uh, of uh, dominance it's a dominant framework of cisgenderism and heterosexuality mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and so the the idea that would be these are creaking that actually the world is is changing uh, that actually black lives matter uh, makes the world of matter change the, the bodily matter mm -hmm. that cannot re, we cannot stay where we were now sure. the people can people can try and destroy the MOU then then try and then then don't take any notice of it we, we've agreed to it because we want there to be people who are protected mm -hmm. and we know they from our own lives what that means and, and people, people, who, people who need go on, go on. I was going to say, and and there are people who are trying to stop us existing, and have in history tried to stop us existing. That's where the word faggot comes from, is mm -hmm. be, is because of putting uh, trans people bundles of wood, mm. uh, yeah, but tied up bundles of wood under. Uh, uh, the the fire uh, that was used for a witch burning. Um, but the thing is, people die and then new people come. And where there are people, there are gender and sexual diversities. It, it had yeah. that no one has succeeded in eradicating this. Let, um, let's um, just shall we try to wrap this up because we could be we could be nobody's going to want to watch this if we just keep writing on we're, okay. we're having a rant really what do we want from this as an outcome i think one of the things is we'd like people to read the mou yeah actually read it it's not a long document um we we believe vehemently uh, and, and with the, every passion we have that people should be trained to be working in this area um, and that the training that they've had, if they've had any, has been inadequate and it is necessary um, because things are complicated. It's not, it's not difficult, but the training is necessary. And that we'd like them to send in, to read, to read some of that consultation, particularly the numbers 34 onwards that you highlighted, Iggy, and send in their comments to the government about the, the conversion therapy consultation. In short, is that? And I'd like to make this request, oh. which is that if people are concerned, if people are afraid, read the MOU on conversion therapy 2017 and find where, what it is that you're concerned about is in the MOU, because there's a great deal that's been said about the MOU mm -hmm. that actually isn't in the MOU. It's not mm. even there. In fact, it's the very document you're wanting to, to protect the things that you care about. So go directly to the MOU. And uh, if you hear things about, well, yeah, well, that's what it says, but that's not really what they mean. Well, it's what it says. So the document 
is what can be used and can be referred to, not interpretations that are supposed to be really what we're talking about, because we're going to be held yeah. to account. We have signed this document. The first page is all people need to read who are individual practitioners. Yeah. And, and I, I, can I just say, you know, as a, we are the MOU isn't an organization, it's no. a coalition. No. Uh, it's a coalition of uh, over 20 organisations that have come to the table to agree that we must protect lesbian, mm -hmm. gay, bisexual, transgender, binary and non-binary and asexual people. And right. our future will include intersex. We've already had that discussion. Mm -hmm. We aren't um, we are not an organisation. If people feel that the MOU as a document is upsetting them, then if you are a therapist in training or a qualified therapist, please contact your organization. That's where you start. Mm -hmm. And your organization will then represent your views and bring them to the MOU. Um, that's the way to do it. Uh, right. But I have to say, as the chair of the MOU, and I am incredibly proud that of everybody that's come together to support the MOU, because what the MOU does is it protects a group of people who have been victimized, killed, destroyed, simply because of who they love. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is making sure that in the future, young people who don't even know today that they are LGBT, QIA will be safe in the future. And I hope that all therapists would want to make sure that that stays as it is. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant.